like to minister in, I like what Ben has been saying, I think God is going to start to fill our hands in this month of March as we go into it with the promises of God and he's going to bring us out into resurrection someday, a new kind of people. Today we're going to talk about being restorers of community and a community can maybe sound like some ethereal kind of thing out there, but community is you and me. He's a restorer of the people. Should we just close our eyes? I just want to kind of read the promises over you, then we'll go into the talk. Jeremiah says, my eyes will watch over you for their good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God for they will return to me with all their heart. For the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like cedars of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord. The Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him father right now i want to break every single spirit of victimhood that's walked in this room today father and we declare the clothing of sonship we declare the clothing of righteousness father if anyone has walked into 2014 with an imposter syndrome Lord, we replace that, Father God, with a spirit of flourishing, Lord, for this season. Thank you. You are not going to knock us down in this season. You are going to rebuild our families in 2014. You are going to rebuild our gift sets in 2014 if we've laid them down. You're going to bring a flourishing to our wider community. You are going to put a spirit, your heart, within your people for this time that we are going to be rebuilders of the wall, for we will arise and build in 2024. We declare that the physical building that soon will go up will be a spiritual happening in our hearts for 2024, Lord God. We declare it in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, flourishing and building upon every person, every family, every grandparent, every cousin, every friend, every prodigal, Declare it over your people in this season, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. We give an applause of worship, of thanksgiving, of belief in what God can do. God is so good. God's so good. Amen. There's power in the word, isn't there? And I've got a Bible here, and it's extra large print because I need glasses. I have actually do generally need glasses. I can't see anyone who's at the back of the room. So welcome. Is it raining today? Is it sunny? I would not know. So extra large print Bibles happen as you move into your five zeros, don't they? Come on, let's hear it for five zeros. Any over 50 year olds in the room? 
They're going to flourish in old age. Should we give them a big applause? Come on, let's believe it for them in this season. <laughs> you want to take the seats? That would be wonderful. Welcome to church. I can't believe we've got reptiles in kids' church. Wow, there must be an increased budget for this season. I remember when we used to go to kids' church, it was just ants, whatever we could find out in the fields. That was our reptile collection for the day, zoology. <laughs> Maybe a slow worm. They do still hang around in the back of sheds. Amen. God's good. I just want to congratulate all the uh, any Scottish people in the room. Yesterday's rugby, thumping the English. What's going on? Sam Cutting, where is the prayer and intercession for our rugby team? Come on, you rugby warriors. We're in a time of restoration. <laughs> That's a sports team. Well, previously on CSI, uh, at the beginning of uh, the month, we said that our calling, we feel, for 2024 is to arise and build. And without intentionality, the social fabric of society tends to lean towards decay. How does God make a difference in the world by giving men and women like you a vision for the community? Vision is not fulfilling your bucket list. Living vision is not living your best life now or your consumer life now. It's not squeezing the grape of existentialism, getting as much as you can, as quickly as you can, and hoarding it in your shed. In fact, I opened my shed um, just a couple of weeks ago, and everything just collapsed onto me because I'm not very good at tidying things up these days. And man, there was some junk in there. It was like half a dozen bikes that don't get used anymore. Okay, there's surfboards, skateboards, hoverboards, cheese boards, ironing boards, all, anything to do with a board, planks, planks look like a board, they're in there, Rust, rusting tools, uh, but that's not vision, okay, that's hoarding, hoarding stuff that we collect. Vision, as you know, is turning God's longings into practical action here on earth. It's Nehemiah. Rebuilding the walls to provide safety for the family of God. It's David facing Goliath and saying, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies the armies of God? It's Jesus declaring to the Pharisees who have lost their way in legalism, love the Lord your God. Remember the main thing. Remember your why. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And Luke says also with all your energy, with all your strength. It's loving your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, he said, all of the law of the prophets hang. It's presence with God and presence with one another building community. And our dream for local families moving into the area. Have you noticed, anyone noticed that they're building thousands of houses up the A27? You often caught in traffic. They move the lights. You're like, yes, they've gone. And all they've done is move the lights another meter down the A27. It seems to always be outside my house. But our dream for those houses is that families would come and live in them. And they would be connected and welcomed home. Our dream is that we would become resilient disciples, forming Christ-centered communities of love. Resilient disciples, because a disciple is not someone who attends church. It's an apprenticeship of the way of Jesus, who is living a Christ-centered life and that is committed to forming a community of love. We want everyone to know God's presence for this time. When the music stops, we want you to hang around a little bit more. We want everyone to know your name. We want everyone or someone to minister into your pain. 
and we want a small family or community to come around you in order to fan into flame the gifts of God that are in you. The greatest social epidemic of our time may be loneliness, but the greatest question of our time is, will church attenders become community builders? Will they once again fan into flame the gifts of God for their season in history? I love this conversation between a desert father and one of his trainees. And it's kind of reminded me of kind of like Ben Knight running one college and, you know, having a chat with Shay over there. And I love the story. And, and the Desert Fathers kind of pulled away from this institutionalized church that's become, that was becoming corrupt. And they started these, these kind of new communities of love in the desert. And it says, Abba Joseph said to Abba Lot, you cannot become a monk unless you become like a consuming fire. Abba Lot went to see Abba Joseph and said to him, Abba, as far as I can say, in my little office, I fast a little. I pray and meditate. I live in peace. And as far as I can say, I purify my thoughts. What else can I do? Then the old man stood up and stretched out his hands towards heaven. His fingers became like ten lamps of fire, and he said to him, If you will, you can become all flame. Do you want to become all flame? That's a good question. Or do you want to be a Christian consumer of goods and services? How do we become all flame? By being filled with the presence of God. And surrounding ourselves with a small group of Christian disciples who will commit to blow on our smoldering embers and bring them back to full flame. It's presence with God and presence with one another. I'm tempted to say, like, blow on the person next to you, because I remember that used to happen on revivals, but, but no, don't do that. Don't do that. But uh, it's, it's Sunday morning, and I know if you're anything like me, you'll have coffee breath, won't you? Coffee breath, anyone? And also, we've gone through a season of 21 days of prayer. Now we're in Lent. Like, I mean, it's a real thing, fasting breath, isn't it? It is a real thing. And um, I think we need to be very careful with the gauntlet of, um, of, of sort of fasting and breathing on each other in very close proximity. Uh, but, but I would like to know, um, does anyone, um, who, who brings mints to the church? I mean, this is very deeply theological. Who brings mints? See, who, chewing gum, raise your hand. See, these are those who are gifted in healing and hospitality. Come on. Let's give them an applause, all the hospitality team, okay? <laughs> Put your hands back up. Now, now say to the person next to you, pass the mints. Come on, pass the mints, pass the gum. Okay, just a warning, keep the menthol-flavoured vaping till after the sermon, okay? I know we have smoke in here, but it's not, that's a different thing altogether, Okay. Healing mints are coming round. Healing mints are being passed around. I'm not afraid, Steph. Can we do a song around that? I think it could work. That was a bad one, wasn't it? Anyway, the world <laughs> has this existential longing for the presence of God because we are made for communion, number one. The first sign of total depravity was not the total depravity itself. It was becoming aware we were cast out the presence. David said, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you, my God. St. Augustine in Confession says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. 
Augustine argued in probably one of the first written memoirs in history that the feeling of loneliness is defining proof that we are humans made in the image of God on this side of Edom. Nicky Gumbel in the Alpha Course often quotes uh, Bernard Levin, one of the first great columnists of, of last century, and he said, there's countries like ours are full of people who have all the material comforts they desire, together with such non-material blessings as a happy family, and yet lead lives of desperation, understanding nothing but the fact that there is a hole inside of them. And however much food and drink they pour into it, however many motor cars and telev television sets they stuff it with, however many well-balanced children and loyal friends they parade around the edges, it aches. Today you could say however many, however much screen time and social commentary they pour into it, however many TikTok views they get, no matter how many cold Tinder hookups they parade around the edges, it still aches. Russell Brand said, drugs and alcohol are not my problem. Reality is my problem. Anyone else just like, yeah, like reality, like getting out of bed? Drugs and alcohol, he says, were my solution to fill an empty hole. And if we can't be fulfilled on the earth, what do we do? What do the super rich do? They go up. Elon Musk's mission is to make human beings an interplanetary species. What's your mission? <laughs> I was thinking like putting the bins out later. Anyone else like, you know, <laughs> changing the nappy later in the day? Thanks, Elon. <laughs> We have this loneliness epidemic. Social, science, social sciences tell us that 37% of people struggle with frequent loneliness, 51% of young mums, 61% of young adults. Uh, Vivek Murphy, the former US Surgeon General, stunned the world when he said loneliness is the greatest social epidemic of our time. The physiological side effects of loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It increases the chances of an early death by 45%. Shocking. What's even more interesting and sad is that there's high levels of loneliness in churches. Over 27% of people in church say they're lonely, even though 60% of people said there was no such thing as loneliness in churches. We long for communion with God, don't we? I do. Do you? But our cultural clothing drives us towards aggressive individualism. They say the national religion of the West is to be a self-made man. John Wayne riding off into the sunset. One of my kind of cultural observations is that uh, we're really into outward door clothing, aren't we? Kind of like mountaineering clothing at the moment. Like anyone got any North Face or Jack Wolfskin or Patagonia caps, hats or Columbia or Animal for the surfers or Borgus? Anyone here? Oh yeah, we love it. But it's interesting that not one of us will ever climb a North Face or ever go up Everest. I mean, Kingly Val looks daunting, isn't that right? <laughs> Most four-wheel drives never go beyond the M25, do they? <laughs> That's right. Because, why? Because we are bubble-wrapped in a narrative of culture that we are seeking to be self-made men and women, but usually it is the men. Mental health professionals say most people today, this is not on the acetate, are seeking autonomy and independence. They are trying to design a life without the risk of intimacy, creating an illusion of community. So it's friends without intimacy. It's the hookup culture. It's work without the hassle of personal relationship behind a screen. It's church attendance without deep discipleship. And we have this new relational economy 
to deal with. A few years ago, as you know, my wife uh, lost her brother, and it was a painful time, another blow, walking in grief again for her. And honestly, we're overwhelmed by the love shown by this church, and Vivi and Sammy and Mariana would be overwhelmed and say thank you so much. But we, this is not a criticism, okay, of the church, but this is a, a cultural observation. Say to the person next to you, Matt is not criticizing. <laughs> He's making a cultural observation. That sounds very uh, middle class, doesn't it? Okay. I'm making an observation on how we express love in our new digital economy. We received, are you ready, hundreds of of messages from all around the world on social media. We received dozens of texts and WhatsApp messages. We even received a few emails and some cards. But we only received one phone call from a human voice. And listen to this, we only received two knocks on the door by people who brought a meal, which was amazing, thank you very much, and flowers. And I'm not criticizing because I do all those things as well. I am part of the cultural narrative. Now, if you take all the people that we're connected with, that's a 0.2% of people who moved out in a traditional form of care and love towards someone. And all I know is that is not God's plan for the local church, is it? But it's difficult to leave the cultural narrative behind. When the music stops, do you know a name? Are you physically praying for someone? Have you got a community of friendship around you, fanning into flame the gift of God? Now let's do some theological work. Number three, whenever there is a loud outburst of love from heaven... Its creative force always produces community. I've always wanted to say this, page one, chapter one, verse one. (laughs) The creation narrative. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was all over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. To my Spanish friends, that's hoovering over the waters. Not hoovering, hovering, okay? I know there's theological problems with that. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light and it was good. And God said, let there be water under the sky, be gathered one to one place, let the dry ground appear. And so it was. And God said, that was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land and that bear fruit with seed. And God saw that it was was good. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then it says, then God said, let us make Mankind, here we go, in our image, in our likeness. Our is a plural word, isn't it? God saw all he had made, and it was very good. The word for good in Hebrew is the word tov. That's so tov, dude. I like that name. It could be a new form we could use. Not that's so dope, or like that's just banging, or that's just like off the shazang. I don't know what they say these days, these young people of today, but like, we could just say when we're enjoying the pizza, and like, like, that is just tove, man. That is just so tove. Totally tove. 
I think this could work. This could become something. Seven times we hear the word, this is good. This is good. This is good. And then in chapter 2, we hear very clearly, this is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And Adam is like, that is totally tove right now. <laughs> Isn't that right? Well tove. Now here's the theology. Why did God say it is not good for man to be alone? The idea of being alone is totally foreign to God. God looks at you, at me, through the lens of community. Because he's a trinity. It's the mystery of the trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God has never known loneliness. Something else that's really interesting about this. It's a pre-fall commandment. I was listening to Dan's friend, Simon Gibbs, did a, a paper on this subject. It's a pre full picture so if you're feeling lonely don't be condemned loneliness is not sin it's a biological and social conditioning we experience that is foreign to the way of Jesus why because God is a community and he has never been alone Dallas Willard once got asked, what, you know, what was God doing before creation? He just wasn't in a rush, he said. He was just enjoying community, fellowship. God's eternal love in community creates a community of love. There is no other way. You can come to church and be saved but you can't be a disciple of Jesus and not be in community because you were created by community for community. See, sin exacerbates and intensifies loneliness. It's not a sin to be lonely, but sin is re-engineered and re-engineered loneliness into isolation. Because sin needs darkness to thrive, doesn't it? Crazy thoughts need isolation to breed. I love that verse that says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You know, we, we have, I don't, anyone here have just crazy, out there, nutty thoughts at certain points in the day? We have tens of thousands of thoughts every day, but we have some wild ones. But I mean, but what's interesting is that we have some crazy thoughts, but as soon as we bring it out into the open, it stops thriving, doesn't it? John Altberg says, tell someone, tell someone, tell someone. You struggling with loneliness? Tell someone. Are you struggling with dark thoughts? Tell someone. Are you struggling with anxiety and depression? Tell someone. Are you going through triumph and victory? Tell someone. Are you struggling with your beautiful teenagers? Tell someone. Are you just struggling with parenting? Tell someone. If we bring thoughts that are negative out of isolation and back into the light, then they just crumble away, don't we? It's very simple. Tell someone. We need community around us. Another example when there's an outpouring of love from heaven, it always creates community of love on earth. When Jesus is baptized and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love and in him I am well pleased. Jesus' first response is he chooses Andrew and Peter, James and John the outpouring of blessing from heaven makes him pour out into building a community of love. And he chose his 12, and he chose some nutty people, didn't he? 
Like, so I'm thinking like Simon the Zealot, okay? This is where we get the word Sicario. Has anyone seen the movies? These guys would have daggers. They were called men of daggers. This is Pete the Zealot. That's what Zealot means, the Sicario. And they would walk in a crowd, get close to a Roman guard, cut their throat and disappear back into the crowd. Jesus only chose nice people. Really? Like, who, where did you get that from? And he says, the Sicario is going to hang out with Matt, the Roman conformist hedonist who's taking money off the government. And he's going to hang out with the Sons of Thunder. And they're going to ha hang out with Peter. And whatever Peter says is always wrong. He always speaks before he thinks. And we are going to build a community of love. That's why we need the Holy Spirit, don't we? We need the Holy Spirit. Another example at Pentecost. When there's an outpouring of love from heaven, it creates community on earth. Pentecost, they're all in one place, in a one accord. Sound like a violent wind comes into the room. They're like tongues of fire. And then next thing in Acts 2, it says this. Every day, because they were people filled with the presence of God. Every day. Not like when the weather was right or when the game was off or when they were slightly hung over. They came to church. Not every day, <laughs> they continued to meet in temple courts. They broke bread in homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, reciprocating what God had done for them, okay, and enjoying the favor of all people. And evangelism was happening and God was adding to them daily those who are being saved. Here's a question. When was the last time you had dinner with your neighbor? When was the last time you brought a meal round to a friend? When was the last time you physically called a friend or a distant relative? It almost seems strange to ring people now, doesn't it? Like, no, what's up? You know, it's... When was the last time you knocked on a door and just gave someone a hug who was grieving? We're running out of time, but social sciences says we were created for four types of community, and you can put them up on the screen. That'd be really quick. And this is amazing that when you read the social sciences, and then you're like, I'm pretty sure Jesus did that. Jesus did that. Jesus did that. Jesus, you know, they're like catching up with Jesus. You're like, Jesus was that good, wasn't he? Like, he seemed to know a thing or two. Maybe he was in this really like, powerful community or something. But social sciences say we need four types of community. Groups of three and four. They're called intimates. People who know your name, know your pain. Or fanning a gift into flame. A place where you can find safety. We all need safety in our lives. Groups of 12 to 15. This is, these are learning environments. We would call them connect groups or discipleship groups, okay? And that's where we can grow, learn, be challenged. This adds self-worth to your life. That's where we practice the one another's, love one another, serve one another, show hospitality to one another, over 100 directives of one another's, 69 are commands. Commands. So you have to be in community to make them happen because... The Trinity don't understand what it's like to be alone. <laughs> Encourage one another, carry one another's burdens. Next grouping is 120 to 150. It's very interesting that this is the optimum amount of people you can be connected to and know. And often movements are birthed out of groups of 120, 150. How many people were in the upper room? 120 people. Okay, most of our services actually, youth, children, Chapel, 6 p.m. are around 120 to 150, 70 and up. Interesting group. And then we have the next group. And that's basically for the fulfillment of significance in our life, okay? And then there's the larger group, which is 200 to 20,000 to 2,000. You don't know everyone in the room. But these are moments that are great for encouragement, celebration, aspiration, wonder, Blue sky thinking. We're in big worship events and it's like, my God, you 
are beautiful. Four community groups, and they can all actually be found within the church context. In conclusion, choosing to build a loving community is a high risk vocation. Why? Because love makes you vulnerable, doesn't it? Makes you really vulnerable. All love is a form of sacrifice and suffering for those we choose to carry. And sometimes, if you're like me, I've lived in community for <laughs> nearly two decades and I've done church for nearly 50 years and all the greatest moments in my life of being in community and all the biggest moments of pain and suffering have been in those same communities here in France, in Argentina. But there's no other way, is there? It's the way of love. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says that only love gets close enough to know. We do feel pain and hurt. And it's real. But what do we do? Build a Death Star? Hang around with cynical people? Change our groupings with people that are mad at churches or communities? No, we're called to the way of love. But pain is real. It's risky being in community, isn't it? Being in a life group or we call them connect groups. We call them so many things over the years. Life groups, connect groups, cell groups, but that linked to terrorism, so that was a bad idea. Um, <laughs> tribes, you know, whatever you want to call them. And, and have you noticed that there's always an oddball in every small group? And some people are like, some good news, you know, some people are like, oh, there's no oddball in my group. They are the oddball. They didn't know it, did they? It's their blind spot. It's, I love it. It's excellent, isn't it? The comforting news is my wife thinks I'm a oddball most of the time. <laughs> and I'm a difficult person to love. If she's be really honest with you, we're both set at certain points. Love is difficult. But pain's real. I was, I was just leaning into a leadership conference this week and only 30% of pastors and leaders carry on building community and love church when they hit their 60s and 70s. That's a shocking stat, isn't it? Men who love community, poured their heart, their life, their, their treasure, are now walking shells and they, because they poured everything out and been hurt. Because of pain, that's it. Pain of suffering, pain of broken family, pain of boredom, pain of change, the pain of poor pay, the pain of grief, the pain of loneliness, the pain of transference of blame, the, the pain of just being criticized. And most of them burn out. And I love what Coma says that God can, you can burn out or you can be burnt clean and you can go back into community and, and love and love again. You know, clinical burnout is increased responsibility, okay? No control and no reward. That's what clinical burnout is. So you think about like, leading anyone through the pandemic, you do that? Increased responsibility, man, that was tough. We unified and we grew. It was an absolute miracle of God, wasn't it? And one of the reasons we grew, just like to say, was because we wrote hundreds of handwritten notes that were personalized and we gave thousands and thousands and thousands of meals out and knocked on doors. I, I don't know, that, I'm just saying that, I think it may be one of the reasons we thrived through that season. Increased responsibility, little control. It's like, I don't know what the outcome is gonna be, no reward. Whatever the, is gonna happen, it's gonna be painful and it's gonna lead to loss. Healthy work experiences are measured responsibility a level of controlled outcomes. We know where we're heading, right? And healthy reward, in other words. It doesn't have to be financial, but it's security, self-worth, and significance. James says, confess your sins to one another and you will be healed. You can't 
confess your sins to a mirror. You have to confess your sins to one another. I need to confess my sins to people sometimes. Like everyone else, what I don't confess, I repress, and what I repress oppresses my health. That's why you have 45% of people having early deaths because of loneliness, because what they didn't confess, we're born into sin, we repress, and what we repress oppresses us physically. That's why we need healing of God. Loneliness can take years off your life, but that is not God's calling for your life, is it? The righteous will flourish like a palm tree and they will grow like cedars of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord, in community. They will flourish in the courts of our God in worship and they will still bear fruit, listen to this, in old age. We're going to be a church of the 30%. Do you believe that? That when Dan and myself and John, are you already old? Uh, if some of us are in our old age, we're going to be flourishing. We're going to still be loving community. We're still going to be building the church, whether it's here or abroad or around the world. But we make a decision. And you have to make an intentional decision, even through the moments of pain, to build communities of love because there is no other way. God is a God of community. And when He's poured out in love upon us, the natural response is for us to pour that love out on other people around us. Let's stand to our feet. I've gone six minutes over. I'm in the, in the red. I could get projected out into Thorn and Marina. Okay. Let's close our eyes. Is anyone dealing with those levels of pain I mentioned? I know some of you are. You're going through all kinds of moments at work and separations in relationships. Maybe you're here and you've been through pain of church. I get that. There's no perfect community. Often you find that people that are from big churches go into small communities in order to get healed. And people that have been healed in small communities go into big churches to hide in community so they can be healed. Either way, you've got to get healed. <laughs> you've got to get healed. Are you carrying pain? I know I am in certain areas. Are you carrying grief? I know I am in certain areas. And I need the Holy Spirit to fill the wounds of pain and grief and sorrow in my life because I am committed to flourishing in the house of God. Are you? Father, thank you for your word. May we be a people who become resilient disciples, forming Christ-centered communities of love. And may the ache that is inside of us here for community carry us home. And may we abandon superficial connection for the people of Jesus, the people of love. And may the greatest outbursts of love from heaven that we see at the cross of Christ, creating us a heart of love for one another. As we sing this song, guys, and you want prayer, come and get prayer. Don't leave this gathering today and not be part of a community group. Every week we say, contribute, care, connect. We're not just trying to be cool because they've got C's in them. Like, you are cool. You are called. You are cool as well, but you are called to love one another, to be in community, to receive that love. And there's no perfect community. They are full of oddballs like me. But within that work, God manifests himself because he is a community of love. Father God, do a work of compassion in us in this season, Lord. By your spirit, may we become restorers of community. May we be known as the generation that put a sword through this epidemic of loneliness that has struck our youth and mums and pastors and leaders. 
just like in the day of Acts, may you come, Lord, and pour your spirit out that every day we will meet in the house of God, from house to house, that we'll be having meals together. And I pray, Lord, today that you would forge commitments of relationship that would go on for decades and decades and decades into the future and that we will see the kingdom of God manifest through your local community, the church, in this season. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.